One of the concepts is that consciousness itself is a non-local phenomena. That means in consciousness we are unified everywhere, every when. It is our focus of attention or our alignment, what we pay attention to in one particular moment. Right now I'm paying attention to being in the body. But that doesn't mean that I don't exist everywhere, every when. All particles, all things have these dual components, a local manifestation and a non-local existence. So perhaps then being more than our physical bodies is identifying with, paying attention to that non-localness of who we are. What the quantum hologram is, it's based on the well-known uh, fact that matter emits and reabsorbs quanta of energy, photons, at the most basic level of nature. And that those photons have a non-local interconnection, uh, regardless of where they go thereafter, they are interconnected. Take the quantum emissions from any body of uh, matter, from a human to a chair to uh, anything, that you study it as a group, it is carrying unique information in the event history of that object. Wow, this is a rather fundamental discovery because it is saying that information at the quantum level in nature is as important as in energy itself. What the physicists tell us is that when particles are entangled in the process at the subatomic level and they go across the universe from each other, should they, they maintain a correlation, a coherence. And if something happens to one particle, it is instantaneously known or recognized by the other particle, regardless of where they are in the universe. That's instantaneous communication. That's called non-locality. How would one experience that subjectively? What is your subjective experience of non-locality? Many people experience it as an out-of-body state, an out-of-body situation. We've heard about this when we think of a near-death experience. People seem to float out or perceive themselves to be some way distant from the physical body. The question comes up, is there then a, a separate body or a second body? Many people have a philosophic opinion that there is, that there is a spirit body or a soul. The physicists would reflect back and say, well, we don't have any measurement or proof of that. So the in-between road might be a habit. I'm in the habit of feeling myself in this body. And when I become non-locally aware, a near-death experience or an out-of-body experience, as a habit, I think I have a body. But perhaps it really isn't. Perhaps I am more than that, more than the concepts of a body. If we can become aware of information that's not available to the physical senses, it's available only if we are non-locally aware. Something in the future, something in the past, something distant in space from us, something that we couldn't know with our physical senses and that information comes to us, therein lies the proof. How else could we possibly know this but that we were more than our physical bodies. You are not a human being with a soul. You are a soul that temporarily inhabits a physical body. Astral projection is probably one of the coolest things you will ever experience. Imagine this scenario. You're lying in your bed, eyes shut, completely relaxed and totally awake. After a few minutes, you feel your body becoming heavy and numb, and then you start rising up, floating a few feet above your bed. You look down and find that your physical body is sleeping peacefully on the bed. You notice that there is a glowing, pulsating, bluish-white cord connected to your physical body. You are calm, relaxed, and awake. This is not a new experience for you, and you feel a blissful sensation of peace because you are now unchained from your physical shell. You are experiencing a joyous feeling of exhilaration and freedom from bounds. You look around the room and see that everything seems to sparkle. Everything seems to have life, more vibrant. 
You fly through the ceiling and into the sky and look down at your house becoming smaller and smaller, and soon you can see the curvature of the earth. You think of a friend of yours who lives across the world in Sweden. By thinking about him, you consciously go to him and you zoom across the world and soon you're coming down into a house. You see your friend eating cookies at his computer. He's wearing blue jeans and a white t-shirt. Soon you realize it's time for you to go back and you think about your sleeping body. You find yourself back over your house, slowly moving down into your bedroom and then back into your sleeping body. You wake up and go to your computer. Your friend is on Skype and you tell him what you just saw in your dream. Your friend gapes in amazement. That's absolutely right, he says. My friends, Welcome to the world of astral projection. Astral projection is a phenomenon that is becoming rapidly more popular in the last 20 years, and even more so in the last five. It is a process by which the human consciousness temporarily leaves the physical body and functions independently, while the physical body remains still and passive throughout. This results in observing the world from a point of view other than that of the physical body, and by means other than those of the physical senses. While astral projecting, however, you retain a very high level of waking consciousness during the experience and can remember the event in every detail upon returning to the physical body. For many people, this happens randomly while asleep, becoming conscious in the middle of a dream. If you haven't, odds are somebody you know has. This is a very common experience, which is also known as lucid dreaming or out-of-body experience, OBE for short. This may sound crazy, but it really isn't. It's just relatively outside of the average human consciousness. In fact, we all experience this out-of-body state every night when we sleep. Most of these projections are unconscious because we are not trained to remember them. We'll be talking more about that in a bit. Astral travel was also known about in ancient times. The Egyptians called this their light body, Ka. They left inscriptions and drawings on rock walls depicting the soul leaving the human body. The Tibetans called it a double body, which housed the soul. Many Greek philosophers like Plato, Herodotus, and Hermotimus all talked about this as well. It's even written about in the Bible, for example, in the Apocalypse of John and as well as the Epistles of Paul and Tarsus. Reports confirm that at least 1 in 10 people have experienced a conscious OBE, either spontaneous or controlled. Spontaneous OBEs can occur at any time, while sleeping, during sickness, under medication, during an accident, or even while meditating. Controlled is like it sounds, willingly leaving the body. Before we continue, let's talk a little more about dimensions that we established an understanding of in Lesson 7. The dimension I'd like to talk about in specific is the fourth dimension, which is also generally referred to as the astral realm. Those who have visited the astral typically find themselves in an environment where all senses seem greatly magnified. These senses are not our normal physical senses, but inner astral senses. Thoughts can actually be seen to take shape instantly and anything desired can be manifested by means of the powers of the imagination in the very process of creation. It is the ultimate place for true creation to take place because you are only limited by yourself in what you can create. The astral plane vibrates at a much higher frequency than the physical plane. There is no gravity, or at least if there is, you're not bound by it. But the whole point that's so significant to us is what has emerged out of all of this. What has come out is that, first of all, because bear in mind that we have long ago gone past, quite naturally, because I demanded it, I needed the answers. So we went past this thing, this unconsciousness called sleep, to find out what was happening later on, where uh, we are not uh, getting too much signals from the physical body. What's happening out there? And there was an important thing came out of it. And that is that consciousness is a continuum. It does not stop when we lose consciousness here. If we are not conscious here, we are conscious there, whatever there is. I don't pretend to say what that definition of there is, but we are there. So that means very simply, when you're, you go to sleep here, you don't lose consciousness, you just shift along the spectrum of consciousness to another kind of wakefulness. Now this is, this is um, and we in turn, but this consciousness attempt to understand that phasing, that part of human consciousness at work there, and it's very difficult. So we try it and use dreams and all sorts of things to try and attempt to understand that consciousness, that, that being there, again, whatever there is. And out of that saying that we don't know how far that spectrum of consciousness goes, that long band, it's, it's, it's endless. And we call that the interstate. What are we doing? Well, you see, that's the important thing, is we let our left brain get into the act and say, what are we doing? We let our intellect, not just our imagination, but our intellect get in and say, what are we doing? 
Well, we finally got around to thinking we have a pretty good way of defining, of stating what we're doing. And that is that we as humans, and let's take the simple ratio of, of here we are now, and we are focused our attention in time-space, and we are very much, uh, say, if you were watching this particular film, you would be focused your attention here. And that is that type of phasing. We are in phase with time-space. Now, if you don't look away from the TV or something and are thinking about what you will do tomorrow morning when you get up, you are a little bit out of phase because you're not concerned with this here now. You are thinking about, you are thinking and doing nothing but thinking. And when you do that, then you're a little bit out of phase with time-space. So you can get the patterns of phase relationships. You're still here, but and your consciousness is uh, not only here in your physical self, but you're a little bit out of phase. And as you do this a little bit more, you get beyond inattention, you have what we call daydreams. So you are focused very much in your mind here, but your body's here, and you know your body's here, and you know you're still in time-space. And so there is a phase relationship. Say, 60% of you is still in your physical consciousness, and 40% is over here daydreaming somewhere. And if you move it a little bit more, you get into such things as out-of-control phasing that are caused by uh, alcohol, for example, and you're drunk, or uh, uh, drugs, and you're all on some drug high. And it's all uncontrolled, though. It's tremendously uncontrolled. And you can't start it, stop it, but you're out, out of control. But you're out of phase. So you are perceiving two things at once. The out of control stuff here, and you have physical matter. And there begins the other very serious question, is that the person who has dementia or some form of psychosis is in a dual phase relationship and cannot differentiate between the time-space physical phasing and this other that he perceives. So he sees little men and he hears voices and all kinds of things that are, are coming to him from this other phase relationship and he can't explain. And so he tries to mix the two to the degree that they are both the same thing when they're really not the same thing. So he goes into a mental hospital or they give him drugs like beta blockers to stop this other phasing. So, if you think of that moving onward out through there, you can see what I mean by phasing. I can probably say, take a piece of paper and say, uh, this, for example, is a, is a phase relationship, and that's totally focused. Can you see it on the camera there? That's pretty good, isn't it? You don't have to focus the tight, but just get the angle. Now, as this, I turn this, this is moving slightly out of phase. So, you have difficulty seeing the print more and more until this way it's very narrow you could not even uh, define what that is it's just a line there and if you're trying to read this you're having great difficulty because you can't even see it at all now now you're seeing another type of something uh, you're seeing not this but something else so you're completely out of phase of time space so it's that type of thing of these are ratios and everything is ratio in terms of consciousness. The interesting part, of course, is that uh, we have certain fascinating things. And that is that uh, when uh, there comes a point, uh, we all face, there are certain things like death and taxes we all have to face. Well, one of them we have is facing physical death. And that means that this mm -hmm. tuning device that we have uh, called a physical body doesn't work anymore. So we have to phase out of it. And we're completely out of phase, and this doesn't work, so we are totally there again. Our consciousness is not dependent upon this. Mm -hmm. It's over there. And being over there is, uh, again, uh, a reality. And this is the thing that you begin to understand the more you get into this, that there is other realities which this mind that we have, this human state, can be conscious over in these other areas. And you can learn and do this 
long before you're forced to drop this physical body and go on, you can go play there. What is what is the yes. significance, Bob, of this ability that you've proven that we have to contact these other realities or other phases? I think the uh, the most important thing, first of all, is to understand these ratios, so that we can we can begin to uh, just like we do with all of our our uh, physical sciences, classify. Uh, plants, uh, biological sciences, begin to classify these other states of consciousness as to what they really are and explore them. Why do that? Uh, the first and foremost thing uh, certainly comes out that uh, we around here have long gotten to the stage of, that we know we are more than our physical body. What does that mean? That means that you, uh, it doesn't make any difference what you do here, whatever you do. Uh, and this is contrary to a lot of belief systems, no doubt about that. But whatever you do, uh, your performance, your behavior here, uh, doesn't mean whether you're going to exist or non-exist uh, after you die physically. You, you can be the, the, a wonderful saint or you can be the cruelest person you can think of, but you're still going to survive physical death. That's an automatic thing. And this process lets you begin to know that, not believe it, but know it. And there's a great difference between believing and knowing, a huge difference. You can listen to me and say, I believe you, but if I give you the tools so that you can find this out and say, oh yes, now I know it, think of the wonderful freedom that it would give you to know that you survived death. Not believe it, but know it. Look how that would affect your life, that if you know that you survived physical death. This is one of the things that's very common in the use of hemisync. Eventually people get to that knowing stage. They know that they survived physical death. It's great stuff. Because that lets you play here. That lets you live that much more fully simply because uh, that thing that's controlled you so much in your life, the fear of death, no longer exists. Now we will continue and we will look at the way Ben looked at reality. Because what is it that gives us our reality? And it was described in his book, Stalking the Wild Pendulum on the Mechanics of Consciousness. And I will talk later why he used the pendulum as the symbol of what he was talking about. We are dealing with two realities. One is this physical, solid reality that we get blue and black marks from, as he said, when we bump into it. But the information about it is given us by our senses. So that is our subjective reality. And so the two really are giving us the totality of our environment. So what is the objective physical reality? And let us look at the atom. If we magnify the atom and zero in on the electron, and now we think now we will get the answer to what physical matter is. But if we analyze the electron, all we find is an oscillating electromagnetic field. There's no physical matter as such. So we think, well, maybe the nucleus will give us the answer. And we zero in on the nucleus, and we find that it too is only an electromagnetic oscillating field in the void. Because between the nucleus and the electron and outside of them, there is nothing but void, the same void that fills in the interstellar space. And the ratio of the distance between the nucleus and the electron would be analogous to a, to a head of a pin in the middle of this room and something rotating around it 30 feet away. And the rest is void. So what is physical matter? Ben drew an analogy between the electron and the pendulum by looking at the cross-section, as it were, of the atom and comparing it to reciprocal motion. In other words, we see the electron now on this side, now on the other side of the nucleus, which would be the pendulum motion. So what happens in the pendulum? It stops, it moves, stops, and moves again. In other words, it's action and rest, action and rest. If you took an actual pendulum and would swing it and attach a pen to, the, to it, and you would draw a piece of paper under it like this, 
It would describe a sine wave. Here the pendulum moved and stopped, moved and stopped. And reality really are the spaces between the points of rest. We perceive reality when there is motion. And reality is really nothing but oscillating fields in the void. And the reason I can touch this screen and I don't go through the floor is because my atoms or the electrons of my atoms are actually repelling the electrons of the floor. But if I would speed up my vibration, then I could very well go through the floor. So that it's the interaction between uh, the uh, atoms in this reality that gives us the illusion of solid matter. So how do we get information about this solid physical reality? It is through our senses, through the subjective reality. So let's look at that. How does the neuron work? If this is a neuron, and this is the baseline when the neuron is at rest, when it's stimulated by something, and it doesn't care whether it's a loud noise or a bright light, it simply says, ouch, I'm being disturbed. So the more such spikes you have on the baseline, the more intense the stimulus. But somehow through a miracle of our physiology, our brain can construct our reality out of these spikes that simply indicate a stimulation of the nervous system. And we see beautiful flowers and animals and the sky and so forth. And as we know, our senses are very inadequate. They're very limited and imperfect. Even bees, for example, can perceive ultraviolet li uh, light, and uh, dogs can hear the ultrasonic, so that we see reality through our senses only through a very narrow uh, slot, and the rest is really unknown to us. And so we're looking at the physical objective reality, which is oscillating, as we saw, through another system, our subjective uh, reality through our nervous system, which also perceives it through action, rest, and action, and rest, and action, and rest. So one oscillating system is looking at another oscillating system, and the picture is very blurred indeed. We can in extend our realities through instruments, uh, telescopes, and microscopes, but in the final analysis, it is only our senses that give us the knowledge. So our subjective reality then is the sum of impressions conveyed by our senses coded in periods of action and rest, which are oscillating electrical states of the nervous system. And we're constantly comparing one thing to another. Otherwise, we would not perceive reality. For example, if the uh, muscle of the eye is anesthetized, then we do not see anything because the eye needs to scan all the time in order to see something. So, both realities become real due to a change occurring between two states of rest. When there is change, there is motion, and whereas the, when there is no change and a total state of rest, then reality, as far as we are concerned, disappears because we cannot perceive it. So let's look at the overall picture. Here is the atom, and it can be um, represented as a sine wave of motion and rest, motion and rest, which is analogous to the motion of the pendulum. Now, let us take a hypothetical situation where we are taking a wavelength, let's say a red photon, which has a very large amplitude. The distances between the points of rest are very far apart. And then we take the same, uh, let's say one inch, in other words, the same unit of frequencies, and we speed them up so that within the same length we have many more ups and downs. And uh, let's say it's a violet photon. And then the points of rest get a little closer together, but we get more of them within that span. Then we speed it up even more, uh, let's say the gamma rays or x-rays, and we see that we get even more spikes and uh, or waves and they get even closer together. Now, 
let us imagine a hypothetical situation where the speed has become so fast that it's become infinite. At infinite speed, there will be no more oscillation, and the points of rest will, in fact, overlap, and you would get a straight line. Now, what kind of state would that be? First of all, we see that it's a paradox because the infinite speed now has become total rest. We could probably call it the state of the absolute. It's the source out of which all the frequencies arise. And it will also have the maximum energy. All energy is in it, but it's all in a potential state. And when it begins, begins to vibrate, then it creates all these different frequencies, which begin to interact, as we saw before, creating uh, our reality. So one could summarize this by saying the absolute is the point where extremes merge, and a state of rest implies infinite speed. In fact, they become one and the same. And this state, the absolute state, is the substrate for all reality which emerges out of it. In particle physics, there is a principle of uncertainty which was formulated by Heisenberg, and it says, when the momentum or the speed of a particle is known, its position becomes unknowable. The more we know about one, the less we know about the other. Apply to the pendulum, what does it give us? When the pendulum stops before it reverses direction, we do know its speed because it's zero. And then it stops again and we know its speed again. So that means that at those points, its location becomes unknowable. And as Ben said, it can be found anywhere in the universe. That is, it becomes the universe. It fills all creation. It is everywhere. And based on this, he developed much of his um, further thinking. If this is our solid reality, and like a pendulum, we oscillate and we take off every now and then, and we touch that absolute state of total rest, but it happens so fast that we're not even aware of it, and we come back as if nothing had happened. But suppose we can expand that state and experience it, and in fact we can, then this is what will happen. Here is our reality, and here is the other reality, which we now have expanded. And we can uh, be conscious on that level sim simultaneously with this level, so that we can actually have the benefit of both. And we can explore that reality and bring back the information. And this is, in fact, what Ben did. And the information that I will be talking about from now on will was received in those states of expanded consciousness. Usually in those states of expanded consciousness, there is a different perception of time. People who come out of those states usually say, time has stopped, or at least it's slowed down. What is happening here? And to put it in some kind of perspective, Ben designed this diagram. This is our time space. And this is the now moment where they cross, which is going from the past into the future, the eternal now moment. And we can project one second on it, two seconds on it, and so forth. It's very reliable, and we can measure it, and we can catch trains on time, and be uh, to work on time, and so forth. However, superimposed on that are two other vectors of space-time, which are our subjective space-time. And usually they overlap, and we don't even know the difference. But in altered states of consciousness, there is a deviation. And by altered states, uh, we can uh, mean sleep or meditation or uh, those deep altered states. And the angle of deviation actually determines the depth of that state. And look what happens. If we project one second, 
we see that now in this position of the subjective time, we have two seconds for one objective second, which means that our time has already doubled. Now visualize the situation where the subjective time tilts more and more and more, where it practically becomes parallel with objective space. And this is what it would look like. Our subjective time is now overlapping objective space. What kind of situation would that be? Well, it would take no time to go anywhere because you are everywhere at once. Because your subjective time has overlapped objective space and it's become infinite. This would be the state of samadhi, the ultimate expansion of consciousness in which you in, you, your consciousness fills the entire universe. Well, in those states, where does one go? There are many places to go. And again, to put it into some kind of perspective, Ben designed this diagram of the levels of consciousness in creation. Because every level, as we saw before, reflects a state of evolution of matter on that level. And there is an indigenous population on all these levels that relates to that level. And our human band is only over here. So he looked at consciousness in its totality. If this vector here represents the quality of consciousness, this one represents the quantity of, of consciousness or the capacity of a nervous system to react to stimuli. So here we put the atom, the virus, the plant, and an animal, and finally a human being. So this is where we are in the range of things, and there are many other levels above. And of course, it's all going towards the ultimate state of the absolute that we talked about before. And they're all contained within it. Consciousness is modular. A larger consciousness contains a lesser consciousness. We also see here these curves. And these are called energy exchange curves. And they peak in the middle of each band, which means that the interaction with the environment here is the highest. And I find myself and you find yourselves in this physical reality because our energy exchange curve is highest in this level. However, we can also interact with the neighboring realities. But as you can see, the, the uh, uh, curve here tapers off so that we're not interacting as clearly and as well in those other realities. But still we do. And our nervous system is capable of spanning all these levels, except that we seem to be tuned only to this physical reality. And like a radio set, we can receive all the others, but we keep listening to this one. But it's up to us to tune into all the others as well. Now, the reality below us is the animal, plant, mineral. Those are the realities that um, Castaneda talks about, for example, in his books, the interaction with those realms. And the upper part uh, is interacting with the next level to the human band, which is the so-called emotional level or astral. There are different names for these levels, and it doesn't really matter as long as we know what, what it means. And the next level is the mental, then the intuitive or causal, and so forth. There are certain characteristics about this, these levels, and we, we interact with all of them, and we can function in all of them. Uh, the, the one next to us is the emotional level. And uh, this is where we go in sleep. As Ben said, this is a preview of coming attractions, because when we die, this is where we go, and we all interact on this level. The next level is the mental level, and uh, emotions, in fact, are not allowed there, so that before you can cross the boundary, uh, it's almost as if there is a customs official who says, any emotions to declare. And down you go if you can't uh, release emotions that are negative, actually, the emotions such as fear or anger. However, love, which sometimes is perceived as an emotion, is what Ben called is the glue of the universe. And without it, in fact, you can't even go higher. So. 
when you abandon those emotions, you can enter the mental level, and here your reality is what you think. It is also so on our level, but to a lesser degree. But here you're actually creating your reality by what, by what you think. The next level is the intuitive level, and this is where uh, we all interact, and um, people of creative professions, particularly, uh, visit those areas, and on that level, they pick up a lot of information, and they bring it down. The creative aha moment of discovery, for example, of an inventor or an artist, when suddenly a solution comes or an image comes, is in fact something that one perceived on this intuitive level. And as you saw before, our time expands on higher levels. So there was an enormous amount of time here to study the entire situation and then to bring it down. But when you bring it down, it appears like a flash, the aha moment, whereas in fact you spent a lot of time there uh, getting ready for it. When you lay back and you see this thing which looks like a rose or a chrysanthemum, this orange spinning flower-like thing, it takes it about 15 seconds to form and it's like a membrane, and then you break through it. You break through it, and then you're in this place. And there's an enormous cheer which goes up as you pass through this membrane. You'll, some of you may know the Pink Floyd song about how the gnomes have learned a new way to say hooray. They're waiting. <laughs> And you burst in to this place, and you're saying, you know, geez, you know, this stuff is really speedy. I mean, that's like describing a space shuttle launching as noisy, you know. You say, this stuff is, it's, you know, and you say, am I all right? Am I all right? That's the first question. And so then you run your mind around the track, and you say, Hmm, heartbeat, normal, yeah, normal, heartbeat, normal, uh, pulse, normal, breathing, breathe, 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 yes, and, but what's right here, right here and from here out is this thing, which no matter how much science fiction you've done, no matter how much William Burroughs you've read, no matter how much time you've spent in the company of the weird, the bizarre, the outre, and the peculiar, you weren't ready. And it's completely real. In a, it's in a way more real than the contents of ordinary reality, because see how the shadows here are muted, and there's a lot of... Uh, transitional zones from one color to another and so forth. This isn't like that. This is crystalline, clear, solid. You can see the light reflected in the depths of these objects and everything is very brightly colored and everything is moving very, very rapidly. And there are entities there. It's not about calling them up or the whisperings of them. Or, no, they're in your face. <laughs> and they're right here. And they, they're, they're worse than in your face because what they do is they, they jump into your chest and then they jump out. And so you're like this. <laughs> and you have to keep saying, keep breathing, keep breathing, don't freak out, pay attention. And, and the entities speak to you and they and they speak both in English and another way which we'll get to in a minute but in English what they say is do not give way to wonder hang on don't just go gaga with disbelief pay attention pay attention and what they're trying to do is they're trying to show you something they are, they are very aware of the fleeting nature of this encounter. And they say, you know, don't just spiral off into amazement and start raving about God and all that. Forget that. Pay attention to what we're doing. And then what they're doing is they're dancing around, they're jumping around, they're emerging explicitly out of the background, bounding toward you, jumping into your chest, bounding away, and they offer, they make offerings, and they love you. That's the other thing. They say this. They say, we love you. 
you you come so rarely and you know here you are welcome welcome and then they sh they make these offerings and the offerings are objects of some sort and the and now remember you are not changed you're exactly the person you were a few minutes before so you're not exalted or depressed you're just trying to make sense of this and the objects which they offer are like um, Fabergé eggs or exquisitely tooled and enameled pieces of machinery but they don't have rigid outlines these objects are themselves somehow alive and transforming and changing. So when these creatures, I call them tykes, when these tykes offer you these objects, you like, you grok it, you look at it, and immediately, because you are yourself, you have this realization, my God, if I could get this thing back into my world, history would never be the same. A single one of these objects is somehow, you can tell by looking at it, this would confound my world beyond hope of recovery. It cannot exist. What I'm being shown is a tiny area where miracles are being transformed. And they then, and the creatures, the tykes, are singing, they are speaking in a kind of translinguistic glossolalia. They are actually making these objects with their voices. They are singing these things into existence. And what the message is, is do what we're doing. You can do what we're doing. Do it! And they get quite pushy about this. They say, you know, damn it, do it! And you're saying, but, 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 and saying, no, do it, do it now, do it! And say, I can't handle this, you know, and then this kind of reaction goes on for a while. Well, then I actually, I don't, I don't take credit for it, it was not willed, but like something comes up from inside of you. Something comes out of you and you discover you can do it. That you can use language to condense objects into existence in this space. It's the dream of all magic. But here it is, folks, happening in real time. And, uh, and then they're just delighted. They just go mad with delight and turn somersaults and turn themselves inside out. And they all jump into your chest at once. And, and after many, many uh, encounters of this sort, I mean, when I first did DMT, I couldn't bring anything out of it. I mean, I just, said, you know, it's the damnedest thing I've ever encountered and I can't say anything about it and I don't think I ever will be able to say anything about it. But by going back repeatedly and working at it, I think I've gotten a pretty coherent, well, let's not go that far. <laughs> I think I've got a pretty uh, clear metaphor anyway for what's happening in there, and I think a lot of people have this experience. When you talk to shamans, they say, oh, well, yes, the helping spirits. Those are the helping spirits. They can help you cure, find lost object. You didn't know about helping spirits? I said, well, I knew, I, but, but I, I, I had no idea, you know, that it was so literal. I say, oh, no, that's the helping spirits. And that, but then the other thing they say, if you press a shaman, if you say, well, what exactly is a helping spirit? Say, well, a helping spirit is an ancestor. Say, you mean to tell me that those are dead people in there? Say, well, yes, ancestor, dead person. You didn't know about ancestors, apparently. This is what happens to people who die. And you say, my God, is it possible that what we're breaking into here is an ecology of souls? That these are not 
extraterrestrials from Zenebel Ganubi or Zeta Reticuli Beta. These are the dear departed. And they exist in a realm which, for want of a better word, let's call eternity. And somehow this drug, or whatever it is, is allowing me to see across the, ba the veil. Th this is the lifting. You want to talk about boundary dissolution. It's one thing to get tight to your partner. It's quite another to get tight to the dear departed of centuries past. That's a serious boundary dissolution when that happens. Uh, what these creatures want, according to them, is they want us to transform our language somehow. And I don't know what this means. I mean, at this point in the weekend and in my life, we all are on the cutting edge. And nobody is ahead of anybody else. Uh, clearly, we need to transform our language because our culture is created by our language and our culture is toxic, murderous, and on a downhill bummer. Somehow we need to transform our language. But is this what they mean? That we're supposed to condense machines out of the air in front of us? Uh, how does this relate to the persistent idea promulgated by Robert Graves and other people that there is a primal language of poetry? That poetry as we know it is a pale, pale thing. And that at some time in the human past, people were in command of languages which literally compel belief. They compel belief because they don't make an appeal through argument or uh, metaphor. They compel belief because they are able to present themselves as imagery. You know, William Blake said, if the truth can be told so as to be understood, it will be believed. And so these things uh, have, and it's very confusing because you wonder, you say, well, have people been doing this for thousands of years? And if so, have they always encountered this tremendous urgency on the other side? If people have been doing it for thousands of years, why is there this urgency on the part of these entities? And who exactly and what exactly are they? Uh, I, I, uh, it, uh, in, it appalls me, you can probably tell, that I have to talk about this because I am not... This is not my bailiwick. I mean, I'm a rationalist who's just had a very weird uh, set of experiences, but I am a rationalist. I mean, I have no patience with channeling, you know, the lords of the many rays, the divas and you know there's this whole thing going around about disincarnate intelligence and it's mostly in the, under the control of fairly shall we say non-rigorous thinkers uh, but i like to think that i am a rigorous thinker but there is a moment i think where you find out something truly truly paradigm shattering that you can't even tell yourself it's such an appalling revelation and the only thing I can think of that would fill that bill is something about the nature of life and death. That you actually go under the board, you find out the thing which nobody is ever supposed to find out in this world. And I suspect it's what shamans know. That, that a shaman is a person who knows the unspeakable secret. And once you know it, you know, there's no going back. I mean, you become fey, enchanted. You're touched by the other. You now are a part of fairyland. And this gives you, I don't know what it gives you, charisma, magical power, healing, the possibility to heal. But it also sets you apart from your fellows because they don't know from it. They don't know. I mean, science can't survive in that environment for half a minute. The entire construct of Western reason disappears into that dimension like hurling an ice cube into a blast furnace. 
you know, it just can't survive that encounter. You're in 21, and this is the opportunity for you to play. We uh, all like the tendency to move outward and perceive externals. One of the key things today, tonight, that I think you can do is know yourself first, because that's what I had to do in going back and looking under the hood, as it were, of what I am. And I can tell you what I found. I found, first of all, in instead of I, instead of in 21 and rolling this way and put it in, it's a crude way, but this is the best I can do. I rolled this way inside and moved inward and it took weeks and months to get this piece by piece knowledge, information or whatever. But what I began to find, first of all, was a catalog uh, uh, being continually updated on every possible part of me, of my experience, my emotions, my activities, whatever. It was a memory bank, if you want to put it the way, a life history recording of me. And you could go up and down that whole life history and back to when you were a two-year-old and, and uh, you can, and the stupid things that you got, you had curiousness of. And I can I give you a little, I have to be intimate with you because I can't do it any other way. Uh, for example, I had always wondered why I was hiding in the bushes as about a two-year-old or three-year-old at my grandmother's house. So I went down the line to find out what really happened, and it was very amusing. I, I didn't want to go in the house because I had a facies in my pants. <laughs> Stupid, but it's these kinds of things you can find out about yourself up and down that thing, and you can, you can find all the, f the stupid things and all the brilliant things you did in your, in your life up to date. And there it is, and it's, be it's constantly being added to. It's as if, another way of putting it is, is, it is as if we are all operating a computer workstation here, if you can think of it that way. And that's a mainframe, and you're feeding the mainframe with all this data, and you're offloading it over here in a, what might be called short-term memory water, but that's all the permanent feed up there. And uh, it's all, anything that you know or think you are, or hide from, it's all there, it's all open, but it's, you, you look at it, it's so clean and so beautifully organized that it's fun to get to know the real parts of you by hitting that mainframe that is a part of, uh, of that whole thing of you. This is all you, this is the points. Not anywhere else, not in some wild universe, this is you. Moving inward to that, <laughs> another layer, which is a busy place, as it were, uh, and I watched with great amusement that there is, uh, it is a, an emotional layer, and this is a layer of all the emotions you're constantly accumulating, and there's a mechanism being, that's shoveling them off somewhere, like this, joint, joint, joint. It's like a, a conveyor belt that's throwing it out this way while your life is dumping it in here. It's very interesting. I, and I found out later, of course, that's the way it looks, but it's actually sorting it out and classifying the different types of emotion. So then moving, and this take, it took a long time to get past these fascinating things. And then there is this intellectual level layer and getting into that. And that was a lot of familiar things, but there again, it was knowledge that I had no knowledge I had that information, which is fascinating. Mm. And totally, and I spent weeks and months in there. It's again, like a system of cataloging. And beyond that is where I really uh, found there was like a barrier there and like a wall. And the wall had been pierced and I later found out how and why, but it was as if there was a, a, a form uh, a crack in this wall, a hole, where uh, it was humanoid in shape, and the shape of me, in my physical self. It was very funny. There's a long story about how that happened, but that's another part of it. And that, I suddenly, uh, one uh, afternoon, had the courage to go in. And what did I find? It was astounding.
here was a, uh, and I looked at it, in, and different people look at it in different ways, but I looked at it as a huge, huge uh, uh, carpet of flowers is the, best, is the best way I can put it. But each flower was a life experience, a life personality. And I looked at these thousands of flowers I said, come on, wait a minute, I've been all of these? <laughs> and <laughs> over here is a laugh, chuckle, I said, sure, kid, sure, what'd you expect? You know? <laughs> and here's this mass of different textured, radiating, vibrant things, and this, uh, uh, this pattern of, it's, it's how to describe it, it's indescribable except it's like a huge family feel, like brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles, it has that kind of feel, only much closer. And there's this total intercommunication with all these in the sense that, that they know you and as you begin to work and go touch one of the flowers, which you soon find out is a face, <laughs> hi <Yeah>. boy, <laughs> and the, the joy that you have finally recognized this. And that was reflected in um, I look and I say, so this is what it's all about. This is what I am. All of these, uh, these life personalities, all of these lifetime experiences. And I then said, and that, that's what it is. And I finally have made that understanding, that brilliant thing. And these voices said, well, it took you long enough. <laughs> and, then I found out much more about what I now call the I there of me and take the hyphen out and it becomes the it of me. And the it of which I am and it is I is indeed composed of literally, and nobody really bothers to count it in my it cluster, um, how many lives I, we have lived but it's somewhere above 2,000, and that's, that I figure is enough. And they don't, nobody bothers. Just go find out for yourself. And I don't want to go over there and count all these different things. <laughs> nobody does, so we don't know. But as the need arises, and uh, there is sort of a, like a, uh, an executive committee, as it were, how these are, sele <laughs> I have no idea. Uh, my, I am, whatever. That selects a, a, a number of life personalities to form a new one and to send down for or insert into uh, uh, an earth life sojourn. And mine was selected for a very specific, uh, from specific life experiences to live in the century of the fire wagons. In other words, uh, the 20th century when uh, we were using explosions to do things with instead of the other means of doing things, to live that. 20th century, and uh, I got to know them. I suspected something like this, but didn't understand it. And these are the clusters that are sent in, in my case, and this is the thing. You all go find this out for yourself. Never mind. I don't buy it. I'm just, I'm, I'm just <laughs> Pied Piper is all. But this cluster, I've, I've recognized symptoms of this when I got to know it. It says, oh yes, and now I got to know them very well. But there are around five that are dominant, but they've melded together to become what I am. And I use them not, I have used them unconsciously or automatically as I have lived through this life. And I like to use another way of putting, but they are different kinds. And they, we, I now suspect, we flicker from those one to another as needed in our life or as we get to them. And uh, I have fun show you ways to do this, and I'll get up and do this because this is an a, a interesting way to show this that I have gotten out of my old theatrical base. For example, if one wanted to be in the, uh, in the rather heavy, serious state, you would get in here like this, you see, and you, you'd be like this, and that's one personality. Or as you moved over here, and you are soft and ethereal, don't you see? And it makes another look at you. And we are all doing this automatically. Or if we went over here, 
and you're all hard to you can do this. Or if you are a ghost like figure, you're this. Hi. <laughs> These are the parts of us that are existent and are there consistently. So this was so tremendously exciting because I then had begun to know the basic, that basic of what I am. And excitedly, I went through this whole pattern of learning the process of all these, what I am. I found out, for example, uh, many of the things, and I won't go through them tonight, of what I am, but because it's much more fun for you to find out your sources and analyze what you are. Why bore you with mine? But the fascinating part is that this is available to you. All this mass of, of historical experience, you now are in the position popping into 21 and go to 21 and turn left, and there it is. And that is not only your own life experience, but all of this mass of, I mean present life experience, but all this mass of others, I assure you, there's nothing that you can think or be or feel or be emotional about that you haven't experienced at least 50 to 100 times before. And you go through the catalog and say, well, uh, fine, I've lost my love, well, uh, my lover. What, oh, and you go down through here and you'll find all these ones, who, well, I did this here, did this here, oh, this is pretty good, I'll use that, you see? It's like a catalog of yourself. And it's your own personal catalog. And that's the view to anything that you can think of that you encounter in this life, you will find a good reference file that is yours and privately yours that you can call upon. And there are some in there that you don't want to do. It's just countercultural, like I'll kill old bastard, I'll kill him, you see. <laughs> and you did, you see, <laughs> that's the point. Mm -hmm. You did. So I I I I'm, this is the new thing that I now lure 21ers in Gateway to play with. Because once you know that, then all the rest, because then, then your vehicle, as it were, that is you, you be, are able to control so much more easily, so much more powerfully. And you will see so deeply. For example, I used to <laughs> learn more even now but my earliest life experience was at least that I can find, and it isn't, there may be another one, is 150,000 years ago if I can measure it by our time. See, our recorded history is a little small segment, and that's the thing you've become so fascinated with. How could human history be that small when there's so much of it? And it's all there, you can go play in it. And uh, uh, I can tell you that it's probably the most important important fun you can have in your life because it's also so very useful and the it of you the I there the totality of it and the other thing oh yes there's so many facets to this one of the things that you must then become aware of and you go find out for yourself again but in my own case I was astounded to discover that in this I there of me when I got into trouble and have in, through my lifetime, uh, a helper has been sent. A and it's one of the earlier personalities who's capable of, to do certain things. Is quote, sent, and that's a relative term, to help me. And I must tell you that the, uh, uh, how that's done is they don't wait. Uh, you think, well, you're going down for the third time. Th they wait to the tenth time, and then they come <laughs> Be sure you get the experience. Is the whole point. Don't 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 make it a, make it a real experience. Yeah, I give the illustration. Of Seems that my it is continuously busy, as all other its are, is retrieving parts of uh, uh, life personalities that have been lost, or one reason or another. So you see. That was the design. They got lost. They're lost in the BS territories, and they're supposed to come back to the it. You see that? To your it. Nobody else's but yours. The I there of you. 
And what happens is that your it and my it, everyone's, are constantly cruising these BS territories to retrieve life personalities of each of us that has gotten lost or, or locked into one of these territories and they're retrieving them and bringing them back to the id. You know why? That's what they're all doing and this is what you're doing. You find out again. I'm being so dogmatic, go find out. And what it is, what your id is doing is collecting all of these so that you in turn can take off and wink out. And that's how I found out about that, because I began to discover, and you'll discover it, that y your it has adjoining its all bonded to it. Uh. You are a part of a bonding system that I am 86% sure that you all are within this bonded cluster of its that of which I am a part. And what we're doing <laughs> is that we are gathering all of the parts of us together, each individual, like you, you got some that are lost in various belief systems, and you, there's a constant flow of retrieving those and getting them stuck back in, they're parts of you. Uh, that, I can give you a classic one that you know about already, having gone this far in Gateway, is that Miranon is attempting to retrieve Shay, who is here, and that's his connection, is he's, attempt, he's a, a, a retriever trying to pull Shay back into their it cluster so that they can move on and wink out and go in another direction. And we'll get to that tomorrow night. So have a good time in 21. <laughs> <laughs> you can be your own ghost now, don't you see? And you'll know your own ghosts. There's another part of it. It's a lot of fun. <laughs>